Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. This interview is all about nutrient density and how the scientific advisor of Chef Dan Barber has been focused on the connection between healthy soils, healthy food and healthy people for the last 25 years. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why am I focused on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! So welcome to another great episode. Today I'm joined by Jill Clepperton, founder of Rhizoterra. Rhizoterra is an international company based in the Pacific Northwest region of the US that's devoted to creating information and knowledge to assist farmers, ranchers, and land managers in their quest to create healthy, productive soils. And it's all for the love of food, which obviously I, I enjoy a lot. Welcome, Jill. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And can you tell, because you've told uh, your amazing background story already to me, but can you tell to the audience why you're doing what you're doing, why you're so focused and actually for quite a few years already on soil? Well, yeah. Okay. So my background is I started my career with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada as the rhizosphere ecologist. So the rhizosphere is the rooting zone. So it's the root, the soil attached to the root and the soil that's actually influenced by the root. And what I love about that is it's a whole system look. So I am looking at everything that affects plant growth and how plants affect everything below ground as well. So it's this beautiful whole systems approach. And um, what I learned when I was there was that, you know, we can actually influence the soils. We can create and build wonderful soils. And plants are the most critical part of that. And then we started experimenting more with different kinds of plants and cover crops and companions and diverse cropping rotations. And what we found was that when just wildly, and I would say wildly, I had this idea that maybe we should, you know, analyze the grain. And so we had to do a lot of work. My technician, she had to work really hard to ramp up the analysis so we could actually do this. And what we found was that when we integrated diverse cropping systems, We had this change in the nutrient density within the wheat, within our four-year rotation. And when was this? Because this sounds almost, I wouldn't say normal now. I mean, at least in the the region X space, it (laughs) sort of starts to become accepted, let's say, nutrient density, the connection to healthy soil. But I'm I'm guessing that this has been, it wasn't last week. Uh, No, it was um, really, we started the study in 1997. Wow. And it took me a really long time. It didn't take me a long time, but I really had to convince everybody to even have a go and, you know, pushing. But honestly, I have always thought that it was my job to be 20 years ahead of everyone, the farmers, not, not, not my research partners but, and my research colleagues, but to be 20 years ahead of the farmers so that when they got there 20 years later, I already had the answers. I had practice for them. I knew how to do some of these things so that when they're ready, the information was there to help them so they didn't have to try and develop that themselves. 
So that was my goal. And um, so we did this work and it was really interesting because this was the first organic research study in Ag Canada. And so what we did was I was trying to integrate no-till into organic agriculture is really what I was doing. And so we had, uh, you know, I mean, we had four replicates of every treatment in there, including this one with integrated livestock. And I remember the first meeting, the first meeting was amazing because I had these organic farmers and I had the um, conventional farmers and some of the people from the commodity groups and stuff. And we were all sitting at the table and I felt like I was mediating a, a labor dispute. I mean, it was like, I can do anything that you can do as long as I can do it my way. And I'll put my heels against yours any day. And it was like, oh my gosh. And it got like people yelling across the table and a lot of passion and a lot of energy. And there started to be anger. And so I said, okay, everybody outside, We're taking a break, everybody out. And they all went outside. It was a nice day. So they all went outside and had a drink and everything. And then they were talking more casually because we weren't around a table. And they came back in and they had the they had the answer. I mean, they had we've been sitting there for like two hours with people who are yelling and arguing, and they all went outside and they came back and we have the answer. But we can't do it in a normal scientific way. And that was a hard sell for me because what they want is what well, we'll have an organic rotation and we'll have a non-organic rotation. And we'll have them side by side. So we'll have simple, which is wheat fallow against wheat with a, a an underseeding, a sweet clover, and then a sweet clover year. And then the next one will have like a four-year rotation, and we'll have crops in the sequence that we want them in organic. And you guys will have, you know, crops in the sequence that you think's okay. And then we'll go into one that's really wild. And I, I said, well, that one has to have integrated livestock grazing. Yeah, okay, well, we'll have a year of, it'll be a cover, but it'll also be a forage for livestock grazing. And those two were pretty much the same. And then the last one was continuous wheat um, with full inputs, like, but not full in the normal way. It was in a way that was measured. So we said, we're only gonna put in what we think we really need. And what was the difficulty for, for the science part that you mentioned, why was that so difficult to, to capture? Because we weren't, the rotations weren't exactly partnered. Uh, you see that they weren't exactly the same. So you couldn't read the variables, there were too many variables, yeah. Yeah, they weren't exactly the same. Like ideally it would have been wheat fallow, wheat fallow, and we would have partnered that with organic, but you can't grow organics that way. You can't. I mean, I, I mean, what would I do? I mean, I, I can't spray weeds. I would have to do a lot of tillage. And my goal was to do no tillage at all. So as a scientist, and, and scientists are reductionists, and we like to do statistics, and that made the statistics very hard. But I came from ecology in a PhD and plant physiology. Which is not about reducing. Yeah. Yeah, which means that I can never have a true replicate. I mean, if I'm in a natural ecosystem, where's the true replicate? Where does it exist? It doesn't. So, <laughs> I mean, I can go from, I could take a step and it's different again. So, and and the same in range ecology, if it's really natural range, every step I take, it's going to be different. And it's very true from an underground situation. I can move an inch and it could be different. I, I can move a centimeter and it will be different. So what we had to do then was go back and go okay i'm going to use ecological statistics to analyze the study and that means i'm not going to have true replicates i'm going to have what's called pseudo replicates and people in agriculture hate that i mean scientists and that they hate it because most of the statisticians in agriculture are breeders and they have like 12 replicates and they have all, you know, 12 replicates of everything because that gives them a better power test and all these things that, you know, in ecology, there's no way I'm going to do all that. And in fact, I, it, I'm i incapable of doing it, even with a team of graduate students. So it's like, no, I, I can't do that. So we, so I had to do a lot of convincing to the statisticians and I had to do a lot of convincing to my fellow scientists who are going to work with us on this. And in the end, they all bought in and we had 12 scientists working on it. We had tons of data and we we went for 12 years um and and it was it was an amazing experience um and 
we generated a lot of interesting things, but it was every year was a sell because every year was like, oh my gosh, like, well, what if the cows get out? They'll ruin all these breeding trials. And because, you know, one might actually like leave a cow patty in something and it will change the nutrition. And that's a really bad thing. But what's important about that for me, looking back now and saying that, is that we had already recognized the value of manure and the value of cattle. Like they were going to change the nutrition of that crop. And that was going to ruin my experiment. And so if you think about that now, you're like, whoa, we knew that. And we knew how important that was. 20 plus years ago. Yeah. yeah. And so then, so then we say, holy henna, here we are. We have, we have got this organic parrot experiment. We are analyzing new, we're actually analyzing um, nutrient density. We, we did that in the second year of the study. And, and we only analyzed everything four years. So we finished the whole rotation and we had four reps of everything before we went through. Now, what happened in that study that also changed the course of my career and my life um, was that we, because we were replicating everything every year, we had every treatment and every rotation every year. So we started to build up a population of sweet clover weevils because we were feeding them every year, like, which no farmer would ever do. And so I also realized that when we set up these experiments, they have a really, they have this other value of showing up all the things that you do wrong if you do monoculture and you do the same thing over and over and over again. Because when I did it over and over again, it only took four years for me to have sweet clover weevils that ruined my experiment because now the sweet clover didn't work anymore to control weeds because I didn't have any because the weevils had eaten it all. Um, and then we had, we didn't, we didn't get a competitive crop one year um, on the canola. And then I had like thistles, like Canadian thistles that, you know, defied uh, uh, in any kind of management. And it's like, okay, well, I guess we're doing tillage and we're going to learn how to manage thistles in a different way. And the lesson in that was, you know, build a competitive crop, but it didn't matter. Every year I had a field day. Every two years I had a field day so that people could come out and see what we were doing. And, and it didn't matter. I mean, I had sisters and everybody's like, oh my gosh, that's a really big mess. And I was like, yeah, it's a mess. So how are we going to solve that mess guys? Like, what are we going to do here? How do we manage this? And, and here's how we got there, but now we have a mess and this is a problem. Uh, now we have weevils, but the, you know, one of the, coolest things that happened in that with a field day was we were we had wheat sweet clover and organics so we sowed the wheat and we under sowed sweet clover in there and the sweet clover grew up and grew underneath the wheat and then the next year we had a sweet clover year and we had no weeds in the organics none which is quite quite unique yeah yeah so we had no tillage we had beautiful wheat. We we had always made protein, so we were always over fourteen percent, and we had the same yields as we did in the conventional. And my yields were always with the county average, so it was always fine. And I remember somebody thinking, you know, so some of the people in the group said, uh, "We, you know, give us the map. You're showing us this, but we don't know if they're really the organic plots. So can you give us a map?" And we said, yeah, oh, here's the map. And they walked off, you know, so it's like, okay, we're having a break right now. And everybody walked off with the maps and went and checked out, you know, so it's a good, you know, they, I said, you're going to have to share maps because I didn't bring maps for like 80 people. So off you go. And they walked and they measured and they said, do you have a, do you have a tape measure? And we went back to the truck and like pulled out the tape measure and they measured from the corner to make sure that we weren't lying to them. That's how far, how, how little trust yeah. there is in the system. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So then they measured to make sure that we weren't lying about this being an organic plot. And after they measured everything and, and were clear, we were good from then on. And the world of research, which you spent quite a bit of time in, what, what made you decide to leave that world of, let's say, research and move to almost the applied research side of things to work directly with farmers, to start your own company, basically, to work directly with farmers, with ranchers, with landowners. 
Well, what was that trigger and, and why did you si- decide to start uh, Rhizoterra? So Dr. Ross Welsh, who was the director of the ARS Research Center at Cornell in the United States, uh, became a friend um, and a mentor. He, he was an amazing mentor for me. And, um, and he was very interested in nutrient density. I mean, that's what he did. I mean, he was very interested in soils and nutrient density. And he had written books on the subject and worked in all these countries building nutrient dense food and, you know, understanding the relationship with disease. And he was working with a breeder like Robin Graham from the, from Australia and really understood it. And I said to him, I said, the rhizosphere is where it's at. And it's not about, we need to work with breeders, but we, we, we also need to really build soils. And then I think I can optimize almost any genetics if I can do this. So we were having that discussion and, um, and, you know, he, he was visiting for the field day and the field day was really well attended, but then we had a public lecture and I had 15 people at the public lecture with this man that knew more about nutrient density than anything. And I was like shocked. Um, and, and that was in the early two thousands. And, um, and I was talking to Ross, we went hiking in Waterton National Park and we were hiking together. And I said to him, you know, we're going through transition in Ag Canada and they want me to move and they want me to do more of earthworm taxonomy because I was at that time as very well known in Canada for founding the Worm Watch program, which is a very successful uh, program, citizen science program on having people monitor earthworm populations and and whatnot. So, and and they were changing from multidisciplinary studies to more single studies, and they wanted to take the emphasis off of applied research and put it on more on pure research. And I spoke to him. I said, you know, I, so I, I don't really know what to do here. And he said to me, he said, well, Jill, um, I'm going to retire soon. And I've written all these books and I've authored all these papers and it doesn't matter. He said, it doesn't matter. He said, what really matters is that somebody implements what you're, what you're saying and what you're, the research you're doing. And he said, I don't think anybody's implemented anything that I've ever done. And he said, so now as I approach 65, I'm thinking about doing, I'm doing all this extension work, which he said, I'm, you know, sort of good at, but not really um, to try and, and promote, what I think is really important. And he said, you are way ahead of me on that. Like he said, you, all these farmers are here at this field day and they're following what you're doing and they, they want you to do more. And they, they are implementing what you're talking about in their fields and it's making a difference. He said, you can't stop. He said, you can't stop doing this because it's too important. And I said, well, I I don't know how I'm going to keep going. Um, You know, I'm going to take a break and do these things. And he said, well, why don't you quit? And I just about thought I was going to fall. I just about like fall off the trail. And, you know, I was like, what? Well, it's easier for you to say you had your whole career and, and you've done all these things, you know, and, and now, and you're going to have this pension and all this other stuff. And you're asking me halfway through my career to like walk away. And you think it's a good idea. And he said, well, it's either that or try and convince everybody to do something else. And he said, but I think you need another job. Like, one that really uses your skills and where you can use your skills. And um, I went and talked to my financial advisor and he said, you know, I think you'd be a great entrepreneur. I said, really? I know nothing. And he said, no, I I really think that you would be. And so um, I was with the government. I could take a year off for personal leave. And I did. And when I came back, I resigned. And, and when, when was this? And that was in 2007. And then you were searching for customers, farmers to work with. Where did you start or how did you? Well, I didn't have to search very long because, but, you know, people weren't using, used to paying for that kind of stuff. So it was a little tough, a little rough at the beginning because people were like, uh, we don't normally pay for this. And they were like, they're expecting it for free because I'd always been free because I worked for the government. So it was, and and it was hard for me to ask for money because I love doing what I do so much that I was like, I wanted to do it all for free. Like I wanted to do it all for free. But that's not possible. Yeah. (laughs) 
I can't live and feed my family and send my son to school if I don't get paid. And I mean, it was a bit rough on everybody because they were like, oh my gosh, like, ah, but you know, there were a lot of farmers that really supported me in that venture and were willing to, you know, pay for a little time, get me studies, like where I did research studies, where I was a, a contractor on research studies and whatnot. And I managed to get going my first. Um, so my first company was not Rhizoterra. It was Earth Spirit Consulting. And I still have that company. It's my Canadian company. And then it was really obvious for me that um, in the States, I had more opportunity. Um, I think I have the opportunity now in Canada, but it was, we still had, um, even though they had a lot of extension in the States and whatnot, uh, I think it was still an opportunity for me to have a company and um, in a different way. And um I had more, I, I did have more opportunity there. So, um, and the universities were more into it, like, you know, having an ag company and a consulting company and things like that. So, and I feel like now we've just kind of tipped, like really tipped where people are ready to pay for advice. I mean, I did a lot of research experiments for companies and things like that. I tested a lot of varieties. I introduced new varieties with Rhizoterra into the Pacific Northwest. And there's a lot of farmers, you know, growing winter wheat that probably wouldn't have grown winter wheat if they hadn't been on my field days. Um, so I, I really feel um, like I've been very, very lucky. Well, I, I don't feel that way. I, I know I've been very lucky and I've worked with great farmers and people who really believed in taking the change, like being the change. And we were the change. And I can see it changing. I mean, um, I was, uh, during that time, it went, when through Rhizoterra, I did a number of workshops in, in Oregon for Oregon State University, and they were measuring, you know, the adoption rate of what we talked about. And what was really interesting, they said, well, we don't know if we, we don't think we've succeeded because there was only 3% adoption rate, like full adoption rate of change. And they thought that was terrible. I was doing the happy dance. Because to you, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah, because farmers take a long time to change. And in five years, that 3% of the farmers that we talked to, which really represent about four or five farms, had made a full transition. That's huge. That, that's enormous. I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of research around tipping points, etc. And I think usually they, they put it somewhere, but it depends on, on the system and the complexity and the variables. I think it's around 10 or 10 to 15 before a full system starts to switch. So three is, is a lot. You're like one third there, basically. Yeah. And I thought that was just absolutely amazing. And I'm jumping around and they're thinking it's a failure because they, I don't know if they figured that they were going to get 90% or something like that. But if they were, holy, yeah, I mean, good grief. That for a farmer to change in five years, like, and if they've changed in five years, that means they started immediately to make a transition. Yeah. Uh, so there's probably a, a second group basically following that a few years later would be similar yeah. yeah and so what do you now work on with your clients with your customers with your partners what is uh, where you spend most of your time as risoterra well right now so welcome to the new year um we nutrient density has really taken off um so all that work that i did all those years ago now people are going like well where is that you know <laughs> like <laughs> uh and I was like, well, I've got to revisit all that. And and there was some stuff we didn't publish because nobody would publish it because it was like too weird. Like uh, an example, what was too weird? Well, some of it was like, why would you measure nutrient density? That doesn't mean anything. Like, um, so what if it changed? Like, you need to measure that over 20 years or something like that. And I was like, well, we measured it over four. Isn't that enough? Or like, we measured over three. Isn't that enough? And it was like, no, I mean, like, if you're going to make a claim like that, you better have measured it like over 20 years. And what kind of claims were you making? Well, we showed, okay, so we showed that when we put a cover crop ahead of wheat 
for example, because that was where we went after we had the weevils. We had to develop more crops to go to underseed. So we started working on companions in the early, like in 2003, we were working on companions. We were working on all that. Nobody was doing, yeah. And that was also really weird. Like people were like, oh, Del, she's so weird. Like, like, <laughs> like that's too weird. But what we showed when we were doing, like testing all these different crops and putting them all underneath wheat, was that we could change the nutrient density in one season. And like, signif obviously significantly, but what kind of levels are we talking about in, in terms of change? Oh, we, we could we could double zinc. That's a lot. And zinc deficiencies are, is a huge issue around the world. Yeah, yeah and that, well, we were focusing on zinc because some of the nutritionists that I had met at a conference in Tufts when I met Ross Welsh, they said to me, said, well, measuring quality is really, really hard. I mean, it is outstandingly hard. And, and they will tell you that again today, that measuring quality, nutritional quality is like something they don't know. It's sort of like measuring soil health and soil quality. So you need, you need a proxy, basically. Yeah. yeah. And I said, well, okay. So Ross said to me, he said, okay, here are the important elements, zinc, and, you know, from a, a malnutrition standpoint in the world, zinc, um, iron, beta carotene, so vitamin A. So I said, if you focus on those three, uh, you know, that will make a huge difference. And we couldn't really measure vitamins very well. Um, so, uh, and they were expensive and we didn't have the money because obviously I was doing really weird things. So it's not like I was like super well funded. And um, so, we, but we could measure nutrient density because we had this ICP for measuring all these other things. So we were measuring nutrients and we could see that in our four year rotations, like even when we took the fallow out and just added a legume for one year, we doubled the mineral nutrient density in the grain, in the wheat. We doubled it. Um, and so we could say at that point, and I have said this publicly, that if you're growing a wheat fallow, wheat fallow, your grain is rubbish. They probably didn't like that. Yeah. No, they didn't like that. But I had the data to show it. I mean, I can prove it. I can put it up on the screen for you and you can see that you don't have the calcium, you don't have the potassium, you don't have any of that. It's terrible. And does the weed look the same? Like if I would have two plots of land with like a, a little road in between, just... Uh, yeah. It looks the same, but it's absolutely not the same. It's absolutely not the same. If I eat this one, I get what I need. If I eat this one over here, I mean... No, I have to eat like three times more of it, four times more of it in order to even get the nutrition, which is what Ross had taught me. You know, like we can grow bushels and bushels and bushels, but is it is it just calories or is it actually good for me? And, and this is the central, I mean, you were mentioning 2020, New Year, and I think it's going to be one of the central themes in, in ag and food in this decade, like this weed, it, although it seems the same, or this tomato is not the same as its neighbor. No, it's because not. It's fun, it could be fundamentally different depending on, obviously, even variety, etc. but let's say they're the same. It depends on management, soil health, and what's happening underneath. Totally. It totally depends on your management. And my grape growers in South, and, and the grape growers that I've, I've worked with and, and know in South Africa will tell you that when they started growing cover crops between the vines, they knew it was going to change everything. I mean, they knew, right? It changes the terroir. It changes it. Yeah, the, the winemakers, I had a, the same I had a discussion today on that. The winemakers and wine people have been very, very advanced in terms of marketing, in terms of terroir, in terms of soil science, in terms of, of a lot of things, I think, in agriculture. They've been the leading, the leading edge of, uh, and we should really look at how they have been doing that. And they know in coffee too, like, I mean, in, in Guatemala, I um, mean, we saw, Hector saw that when he started putting cover crops in, it was changing his coffee and the, and the cupping of the coffee. And if we change the, the, the diversity, if we shift diversity a little bit, we change it again. So um, at Avondale, uh, at Avondale Vineyard in, in, in Paro, South Africa, uh, Jonathan had been really advanced in the cover crops. Like, I mean, he had... He had covers between all the rows and he was, he, he had a whole system and he had ducks eating all his slugs and snails. And, and then he was marketing the ducks afterwards. And, um, and then he said that when he started doing this, and we were having a conversation one night away from the workshop. And he said, you know, I started to see hyrex coming in, like 
native rodents. And, and he said, and then one night I heard a civic cat. He said, we hadn't heard cats for years. And he said, I started to realize that it was growing an ecosystem. Like I was growing an agri ecosystem. So then he did something revolutionary by all his agronomist standards. He went and let the native veld come back into his vines. What is a native veld? Just for the non. A native veld are the native small shrubs. Ah, wow. Like it's native plant vegetation that would have been there. So, and these tree, these, most of these plants are melaleuca. So that means that they are like tea tree related. So they have a very strong, um, you know, well, it's, it's like rooibos too. I mean, very strong. The, the, the roots exude a lot of interesting things. Um, and he knew it would really change. So what happened to the wine? Yeah. The wine was amazing. He created these two wines that were from the native veld and we got to taste them at the workshop. It was the first time he'd cracked the bottles and they were so complex. I mean, the flavors, the spiciness, the uh, overtones. I mean, it was like nothing I'd ever tasted and nothing like anybody had ever tasted. Um, and, you know, and then he was partnering these, these wines with these ducks that had eaten in there and eaten all the, you know, and the whole story became, and his, he called his wines Au Naturel. Um, it became the story of Au Naturel. I mean, where everything was going natural, not everything, because it became, I can create these wines by just changing what grows between my rows. And I mean, you won't be focusing, I think, the whole year on wines, but so what does that nutrient density for you mean now, practically, in terms of your work, in terms of your week, your day-to-day, -day, your months? It means it's changed everything for me. Is now it's become where I was just really mentioning to people every now and again. And what now everybody's going, well, how do we do that? Like, how do we get there? I mean, and what does it mean? What does it mean for me? And I, because I, I met you personally, but before that, saw you on, on an Instagram stories of, uh, or ex an Instagram, um, a number of photos and a small video of Dan Barber, because you are the. Uh, Working with Chef Barber the scientific advisor of Chef Dan Barber, which most people know from The Third Plate. I actually know quite some listeners of this podcast are in the space because of The Third Plate. Yeah. Um, so what is, how did that happen? And tell us more about nutrient density there. That was magical. So I was at Climate Underground um, sitting on a panel and Dan was chairing that panel. So he was the, the moderator for the panel. And... Um, And he was really challenging me, like, you know, I have all these amazing chefs in my kitchen and we can tell you what tasty food is. And he said, if it's any good, he said, I think that if it's tasty, it's really good for me. And I said, and he said, so, you know, he challenged me. He said, well, you're measuring this, like, you know, what's the correlation? I said, you know, I say, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and He said, well, can we measure it? And I said, well, I think, you know, we, we'd have to work together because I'd need to have a tasting panel and they'd have to say, you know, we'd have to have a few things out and they'd have to say, okay, this is the best tasting. And then we'd have to go and analyze it to see what, if there were differences between them to try and understand. And who's better than the chefs of, of Dan Barber, who probably as in terms well, who of- who is better, right? Center, uh, in terms of like his team, he, him and his team probably in terms of tasting experience are probably at the top in the world. But they're all about taste. I mean, their restaurants are all about tasty food. And Dan recognizes genetics are important, but I think that we can also optimize genetics with the way we do nutrients and whatnot. And I, and I know from the work that we've done in the vineyards and in the coffee plantations that it makes a difference. Like, I mean, I don't think that vegetables are any different and wheat's any different than anything else. And so we analyzed all this wheat, like the barber wheat from grown in four locations. So how did that happen? So you're in the kitchen of Dan Barber with all these amazing chefs, including Dan Barber, discussing nutrient density. And you have your tracer, which is this nutrient density measuring gun between brackets. What was that yes. experience like? I mean, we can see some pictures. I will link that below in the show notes of the Instagram Uh, report basically that Dan Barber did, but how was that experience of being there measuring nutrient density? What did you measure? How did you measure it? What was it like? It was an incredibly exciting time. It was so fun to be with people who cared so much about food. 
I mean, cared so much about food um, and really, really love food. So um, first of all, we just started with the grains. Like, okay, barber wheat. Yeah, well, because what's barber wheat for anybody who didn't read definitely should, but the third plate, yeah. Yeah, so anyways, I was, um, so we were sitting at the back of the kitchen and we ha- we set up this instrument and we're all standing around it and everybody's like, whoa. Uh, and it, it and and it does look like a gun. So um, so we're getting ready to do all this analysis and everybody's standing around and we're all really excited. Like I'm excited too. And um, and we it's like, well, what should we start with? Well, I said anything, you know, like we can just do everything. So that's what we did. I mean, it was pretty amazing because we were at the at, we were there at five o'clock. So it was after I'd done seminars all day. So the kitchen was busy. I mean, chefs running around, um, wait staff running in and out. I mean, for me, it was amazing because I was actually in the kitchen. And then they would just come over and hand me something and say, okay, let's measure this. And then we, we Dan and I'd be standing there talking and looking at the screen. And uh, it was fabulous. So anyways, um, Barber Wheat is is just that. It's Dan Barber's Wheat. Um, it's a it's a variety of wheat. And um and but he's also been having it grown in in four different places. So we had wheat in the bakery that had been grown in four different places. And so we took that grain, we ground it up in my coffee grinder because I need to have it ground a little bit because we want to measure the whole density. So the one thing is is that when you're measuring grains, I, I can this instrument will actually measure what's in the outside, and then if we cut it, we can measure in the inside. But if we want to measure the whole grain, because it in with those restaurants, you're actually measuring the whole grain. I mean, Dan's using whole grain flour, whole grains, fermenting whole grains. So we ground it up, measure it, and there was differences between all the four places it was grown. So the same variety, the same, but very different climate management, maybe even different rotations. Yeah. And you could see significant differences between those four types. Wow. Yes, we could in calcium and potassium and zinc and some of the, and, and iron and some of the other trace elements. So we are like, wow, okay. So, you know, so that's where you say, okay, maybe we blend it all, or maybe we just have it grown here, or maybe we talk to the people who are growing it somewhere else and then actually look at, well, how they're growing it. And maybe we change that so that we, everything becomes more nutrient dense. Um, then we measured uh, grass fed versus grain fed beef. And we, at first, we didn't have the same cuts. And I said, well, that's not fair. I mean, we have to have exactly the same cut. Or you have to bl- blend it again in your coffee blender, but I'm not sure if that's... <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, and we're like, no. And I was like, so we had the same cut and then we analyzed that. And then we did fermented grains and then we analyzed bread. And then the last day, I was there for three days. And the last day, we're like, well, maybe we could create whole meals. Oh, yeah. I saw that picture. That was fascinating. What, what happened there? Well... So we blended them all up in a blender and, and I had the chefs running the instrument. So they were running the instrument. Um, and they were, I, I said, okay, you know, it's instruments easy to run. So you guys run it. And we could see where we had more salt. Like, you know, we could see the salt being, we could see, I mean, we could see a lot of differences and then we could see the differences between the meals. And they were like, well, huh. well, how do we create that difference? And then how do we create this difference? And, and, and then we started asking, well, what are the differences? So then it was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to have to analyze. I'm going to have to actually create a calibration for pureed meals so that we can start to understand, you know, what the whole nutrient package is if you eat this meal. Because that's the big difference. This tracer is a, a device. Um, just to explain for people that haven't seen it, it's basically about, let's say, half a meter high, maybe a bit less on us. Uh, basically sticking up so so up from the table and you put whatever you're measuring uh, which is could be the powder of wheat could be the, the mixed meal on top and basically it's connected to in this case your laptop and that's where the magic is because that's where the calibration software is to actually understand what comes out because this tracer is something and you explained it to me before is something that that you can buy off the market it's not cheap at all but it's actually a thing that has been there and has been used in museums to understand the paint yeah. job without actually destroying the, the painting and getting the paint. So it's basically a, a device to understand the quality or the density or the, the paint mixture, what has been used, photons. Yeah, it measures photons. 
it measures the number of photons coming from each element that's in whatever you're, you are measuring. And you don't need to do a whole lot of prep. I mean, you really just puree it and, or we could have done each thing separately, but if we wanted to know the value of the whole meal, we, so now I have to actually go ahead and create a calibration for pureed meals because- um, It makes sense. Yeah. And because we had to add some water, so we know we diluted it. So, you know, I mean, there, it was the first time I never pureed a meal and, I felt terrible pureeing these beautiful meals. I mean, because they looked gorgeous, and there we were, like sticking them in a blender. And oh, it, for science, yeah. I, I was just like, oh my gosh, look at that beautiful meal, and we are pureeing. It. I'm pureeing a Dan Barber meal. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> it's like I was, it, uh, yeah, it was like it almost seemed wrong, but we did it, and we could see the differences. And so now what we were thinking was, well, what if we could create these meals, and even meals for people who had unique requirements because we can actually go out there and say oh you need more of this or your diet we already know if you're diabetic we can do these other things but then we can add nutrients that we know will improve like help you with your diabetes and things like that so not only do you get this amazingly tasty meal but it's awesomely good for you and then we get to the fundamental discussion as food as medicine which Yes, has been thrown around a million times, but we're finally, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, getting to a place we can actually start having a serious discussion. I think John Kemp says that in a number of his interviews, like we can actually finally have, or it seems like we can have a serious discussion for food as medicine, which we couldn't have until now. I think there are a number of people who have been having it. I mean, I have a quote from a scientist at um, UCLA. She's in 2003 that says, now that we have solved um you know our food shortage that we, you know now we can really focus on uh, food as medicine so why did it take so long to get to let's say more general audience like like myself and like other people on, on the podcast before we start using that i think we as scientists are not really good at communicating what we're doing because we're really focused i mean we have tunnel vision and we are really narrowly focused and we are saying whoa i mean we're just diving into this in a deep dive way and, and and we're also speaking in terms that generally people don't understand if somebody's really done a deep dive you're not going to understand that they're talking about pathways and for a dachshund and doing all these other things they're like oh and, and you know you watch people's eyes glaze over um uh scientists are really excited about it but um and and but a lot of people aren't like i have a graduate student now right now working on um, iron and zinc and selenium and how they affect uh, inflammation. And we are actually scanning tissues with the tracer, looking at where, uh, you know, if you're really inflamed, like where all the iron is and where all selenium is. And, and if you're not inflamed, like where is it and how is it broken down? And, and we're starting, I'm trying to blend, I'm trying to bridge the gap. Literally. Yeah, yeah I'm literally, I am. I'm trying to bridge a gap where we are, you know, this is really exciting work on biowire. And and we as farmers can change that. I mean, we can grow things that are really good for people. In a in a very regenerative way. Like we're not talking here about spraying some weird thing, like adding something no. to the system. No, you're actually doing an amazing job for soil, an amazing job for the farmer. And lo and behold, actually the food, it's a different thing. And it's full of the specific iron you need. Yeah, yeah it's a very different thing. And the thing is, I know we can do it. We're not there quite yet, but we know. And, and actually, I think the only way we can do it is regeneratively. I'm going to say that, that I think the only way we can do it is through regenerative agriculture. What makes you say that? There's no way to to cheat or to to play. Because I, I asked the same question to Dan Kittrich. I said, like, can't we, like, in greenhouses, like, really play with all the different elements and variables we have and stuff you can add and he said maybe possibly potentially we could but it, it would be so costly that it doesn't like it would be so costly to, to beat mother nature or to beat nature in that way to beat healthy soils that it wouldn't make any sense you might be able to get to that level but you're actually saying no i don't think we can get to that level of nutrient density without regenerate i really strongly believe that i mean i have worked in hydroponics i do work in hydroponics and, you know, okay, so we've known this for a very long time. Plant physiologists have understood that if roots aren't stressed, like, and I, I don't mean like nutrient stressed or water stressed. I mean, if they actually don't have to push through something, 
they don't develop properly. So in hydroponics, where you're developing in water or some kind of liquid, yeah, they don't have they, that stress. They don't have that stress and they don't have to develop in the same way. They don't have to push. It means that, okay, they take everything up and it goes straight into the plant. And the plants are weaker. We've always understood that the plants are weaker. We, I mean, historically, we've understood that. Yeah, which comes back to you know, the nutrient density and how it is, this, to the full picture of nutrient density and not just yeah. a few things that we've been measuring so far. No, I mean, it really comes down to whole plant health. And it, it's much like us. Plants have to be fit. And the fitter they are, the stronger they are, the more they can fend off disease and insects and the more they talk to each other. And we are exactly the same way. I mean, if you're sitting around swilling nutrients and you're not using your body, you're not healthy. Plants are exactly the same. They have to exercise themselves. And to switch gears a bit in, in this interview and, and get to the, the finance and investment side, you, you mentioned before, we've known, we as scientists have known this for a long time. What do you think are, for like the investors listening to this podcast, are the biggest things to look out for, things to understand more, things to dive deeper into when it comes to regenerative agriculture and, and specifically actually in, in nutrient density? What excites you most if you put your entrepreneur hat on and maybe even your investor hat on over the next years? Well, and this is always the, the tricky question for me. From a nutrient density perspective, uh, we are going to develop new methods. We have to develop new methodology, and we have to make that methodology accurate, and we have to also have the methodology accessible um, for farmers. And And it's not a hard thing to understand, but it once again, it's about putting the information in context, because uh, quite often context gets blown out of proportion. Um, and And I really want so I would really like investors to be making decisions based on science. Ask for the numbers, ask for the data. I mean, you make decisions based on numbers like dollar numbers and, and, econ and, and, and metrics and economy metrics and stuff like that. But we're not asking for scientific metrics. And I think we need to ask for more of those. Um, and we, we have to... Uh, not take no for an answer, like say, okay, well, show me your numbers and show me how you did this. And we also need to understand that um, a lot of the studies that are going to generate these things are things that are going to be a little bit more complicated. And we might even, Weird, maybe. yes, and we have to involve the farmers. And, and fortunately, some scientists are seeing that now that instead of creating these experiments yourself, some of these experiments are already on people's farms. Go and use them. Just go and use them. And then as an investor, invest in some of these farmers that are doing those experiments and the, the people who are going there and, and analyzing them, knowing that those numbers are going to help you invest more wisely and going to help you understand how, the potential of that system to really generate food that is really nutritionally dense. And, and it's going to help you develop all these other markets like food as medicine and develop uh, cover crop seed and campaign crop seed markets and genetic markets. I mean, there's all these other markets that just some simple experiments could spin off. And we're not seeing the whole picture because a lot of times we're focused on the genetics or we're focused on this or we're focused on that. And we're not looking at this, this, this whole big picture. And, and we need to see that we're not just spinning off one thing, we're spinning off all these other things and we're actually creating momentum for other people to change when we do that. So going back to the whole idea of transition, we're actually creating the transition and the movement for transition by showing people that these things are possible and that investors really care because they see the value in, you know, these other markets and, um, and I think that's just now starting to happen where we're, we're seeing those things. And one other thing that I want to mention there, and I thought about this a lot, is that I've worked in Africa quite a lot. Um, I've worked in all the poorest countries in Africa um, because I, I believe very strongly in um, helping people grow their own food. And, and, and that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where I am. I, I really believe strongly in that. And I want them to grow good food. I want, it, I want them to grow healthy food. But I also want them to integrate 
everything. And the one thing I would say about investors and what I really noticed in Africa, and there's a lot of money invested in Africa, um, is that they're not paying attention, investors do not pay attention to culture. And I mean the culture of the people. We're focused on growing food for them, but a lot of times we don't realize that we can't even, they can't even go there unless we're actually embracing their culture first. The things that really matter to them as a group of people. I think that's a point for not just, let's say the global South, but any, any community, any farmer community are seeing way too many people easily step into another home or another culture and, and assume X, Y, Z and, and tell what to do or what to grow or what to use in terms of tools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And tell them, you know, tell them what to do. And it's the same with the peoples of the first nations. Exactly. Yeah. We're not respecting their culture when we come in. And so I've seen, I mean, I've seen in Africa, it's like, well, why didn't you bring in big tractors? I said, well, you know, as a woman, I, I think about women carrying fuel on their heads for 10 miles and think I wouldn't want to do that. So why would I ask somebody else to do that? Um, and, but I have all these oxen around me. I have all these horses in Lesotho. I have oxen. Well, why wouldn't I use something, a, a piece of Amish equipment that's really advanced, but is pulled by animal traction of which I have lots of. And then why wouldn't I do that? Because the, the culture of men in, in a lot of these tribal system in a lot of these systems in a lot of these countries in Africa, men are looked upon as herders and they are responsible for the livestock and their status in the community and their self-worth is based on their livestock and the quality of their livestock and how many animals they have. And if we just focus on growing vegetable matter, then that changes that whole aspect of their community and, and their self-worth. And I don't want anybody to feel like they're not worthy I want them to feel that they are part of this change and that they're an integral part of this change and that everybody needs to work together. And if I'm telling them that they need to throw away this really important part of their culture and just go here because you just need to feed everybody, it's not going to happen. And it doesn't happen. And it hasn't happened. Yeah, we've seen way too many examples of, of that going wrong. Yeah. So that's the one thing that I would say to investors is, you know, be there for the culture, respect the culture of the people. It may not be what you think should be right, but they have to take tiny steps. And the one thing I've also learned um, in developing citizen science programs in that is that everyone, including the people in, in, in developed countries, need to succeed at the first step. So if we are making a transition, every farmer needs to succeed the first step. Because if I don't succeed in the first step, I have no confidence. I, I don't know that I can go the next step, but if I succeed at the very first step, I will go the next step. And if I succeed at that step, I will take the third step. And then by the time I get past the third step, you can walk away from me because I'm just going to innovate like crazy and I'm good. Um, and, and too many times we're not respecting um, influence theory. And, and we've learned a lot about how to influence people in influence theory and about how to cut to the core of of you know what is inhibiting the behavior and and really start working with people to do that and part of that is is your culture in your community every community is different every farm is its own agri ecosystem and oftentimes we're not respecting that we want everybody to be the same and and you know and I'll use a french term at this point vive la différence we need to we need to celebrate the difference and know that one size fits no one. Which is a very, very nice bridge to ag, obviously. I, I want to be conscious of our time and finish with two questions, which is usually becomes more. But to start with a, a very difficult one, because you've been saying you investors and investors should. What if tomorrow morning you wake up and you are in charge of a $1 billion investment or 1 billion euro, depending mm -hmm. on Canadian dollar, depending on what, what you choose? investment portfolio. And I'm asking this question because I think in the sector, we need to get used to larger amounts, not because uh, we have to get more comfortable with that. And we have to start asking ourselves the question, what would we do if people start knocking on the door and, and they want to place larger investments in the space? Because I think 
we're going to see a lot of that happening over the next decade and we need to be ready. So I'm going to ask you that difficult question. What would you be focusing on? How would you, uh, how would you go to put that to work? Wow. Well, I would be putting it to work to change. Um, I'd be, I'd be building some demonstrations. Um, I'd be looking to certain farms and I'd be, you know, um, not helping them, but I'd be looking to really innovative farmers to see if they're first, I'd be asking them. And this is, I'd be asking them, what can I do to assist you? Like, is there something that you really need? You know, if I have this money, is there something that I could do with this money that would, change your life, change your, um, change the way you do things. And, you know, and, it, and, and honestly, I know already that it might be something simple as well. Yeah. If I could have a mobile seed cleaner or I could have a mobile abattoir or something like that, you know, which is, which honestly is like, if you had like a few million dollars, it's not a big investment, but you'd go really like, okay, well, yeah. Now what do I do with the rest of the money? But I'd be starting there. I'd be starting to ask people, not telling them, but asking them to really look at what it is that would make their life, which would help them change or make a transition to something else. Or I'd even ask them the question of what helped you make this change to this next phase of you? Like what drove that change? Because if you're dealing with an innovator, you say, well, what, what drove your change to do this? Well, it was this. Okay. So how can we make that next change? And what do you need from me? to make that next change. And it may be as simple as I need a 10,000 gallon tank to put on my compost extract. And then I need the money to run a field day or to bring people in, you know, and run workshops to, for all the people in my area so that we can, we can all change. Um, And, and I think that's where some of the time we go. Some of it would be going into like, working with people in the first nations and working people in Africa who are struggling with nutrition and, and asking them what I just asked the other farmers, like, no, I don't want you to tell me what the donors think you should do. I want to know what you want to do, because if you want to do this, you will make a change. Like you will actually embed the change in your culture. You'll embed the change and, and it will make a difference. And so I'd be using the money to make a difference. And I've used my time. So, you know, I look at a sweat equity with my company and I donate my time because a lot of times I don't charge and I donate my time and my expertise to asking people those things and then trying to find and match investment funds and, and create studies and, and put people together and build teams that actually make that difference. And so I'd be doing the same thing. And the last part of what I've been doing with that, is is looking at bringing in government officials and people who are influencing government and who are influencing policy change and bringing them to the table as well, but not bringing them to the table. You know, I'm going to put covers on their fancy shoes and I'm going to put a coat over their, their suits and I'm going to make them walk the field with me. And get dirty boots, yeah. And get dirty boots because I want their boots on the ground. I want them to be out with the farmers. I would love them to take the time to spend like two or three days on a farm with the farmer in their home, understanding what they're, or in a community of farmers and sitting there every day and talking to them, not a a town hall style. I I don't want politicking. I want them to really hear and, and experience what these people are doing. Sit in a combine. Sit in a combine in the Pacific Northwest and have the ride of your life in a self-leveling combine. Scare the wits out of you. And these farmers are doing it every day. Like just, you know, riding the side hills, coming straight down, things that, you know, defy gravity and understanding what they're, what they're doing. And also understanding how important it is what they're doing. When they start doing these regenerative practices, stand out of their way. Don't try and legislate them all to pieces, like stand out of the way and let them innovate and, and, and support the innovation. You know, so if I think in the States, like the risk management agency, well, I need 20 years of data before we can change that practice and we can ensure this. Well, how does a new farmer, if they're buying a farm from the bank, they have to have insurance. 
So how do they use this? I'd be using money to change that too. I mean, I'd be using money to get after that. And, and it, even if it meant starting my own insurance company to actually insure these young farmers so they could actually do those practices or creating a bank that actually paid attention to that and, and actually loaned, gave preferential loans based on soil health and based on the fact that I'm building all these ecosystem services in and, you know, give me a preferential loan based on that basis. You know, help me out. That would be truly revolutionary. And, and now for the final question, if you could change, so you, you're unfortunately no longer in charge of the, the $1 billion investment fund, yeah. but you, you have the power to change one thing in the food and agriculture system. And overnight with your magic wand, you, Jill, can change one thing. What would that be? Hmm. If I could change one thing, I think I would do the last thing. I would actually create a bank, much like the microloan system. I would create a bank that allowed farmers that were doing regenerative practices to be free to innovate, be free to try things, be free to do what they thought was, you know, to brainstorm and do their wildest idea. I would support that. Um, I would still want to see some data on it and I would support them to keep records on it, but I, I would be supporting that kind of innovation. And, not, and and some of it would be really simple. Like, well, I just want to try this mixed cover crop and, 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 and I would also support a system of people that were there, just like the chat, you know, when you, when you are on a new software system and you can hit the button to chat with somebody, it's like, well, I want to talk over, you know, I'm going to try this new system. You know, what is the background that I would need to, you know, understand, like, should I have these species together or what would this be? Is, is have something there that would support them. So they just like go, okay, well, now I'm going to go and do that. And um, because I think more farmers would, and everywhere around the world, gardeners, anybody would do some more things if they, you know, felt like they could be successful and that there was somebody that really cared behind them, like standing there to just support their change or for them to be able to talk about their change or their crazy wild idea that was like totally off the wall like I did and and just say, okay, well, you know, I think you should go for it. Let's go and try. Yeah. Just, just the, the Aussies have a great saying. Give it a go, mate. Just be able to give it a go. And they need some regenerative agriculture. Yeah. And they need regenerative agriculture, just like the rest of us. And with that, Joe, I want to thank you so much for your time. I don't think it's the last time we'll be talking on, on the podcast. I wish you a lot of luck with all the work you've been doing. And it's going to be a very interesting year. Thank you so much. It is. And good luck to you, too. I mean, I hope more people support your podcast. I really do. It's well worth supporting. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course investing in regenerative agriculture and food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees and what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You. 
the soy builders and investors in this space, the soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're gonna look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.